Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to this OBF Academy webinar. Today we have Esther Greeder as our guest speaker and she will talk about HPASS and how they are using digi digital badging to recognize the learning skills and experience of people working in humanitarian action. And if you have any questions, please write them to the chat and we will go through them in the end. And okay, we are ready to start. So Esther, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thanks, Minna. Um, so as Minna says, uh, I'm Esther and I work for the Humanitarian Leadership Academy, uh, which is based in London. Um, and we're based within Save the Children. We're kind of a subsidiary of Save the Children. Um, and I'm going to talk today about HPASS, which is a new platform um, using digital badging to recognise humanitarian skills and experience. Um, and while it's an initiative of the Academy, it's also a collaborative initiative. Um, so there's eight different organisations that are sitting on the steering committee um, behind this initiative. Um, many of them are kind of experts in delivering humanitarian learning. Um, and then there's also a couple of big names. So you might have heard of, uh, for example, the International Federation of the Red Cross uh, sit on our steering committee um, and also Pearson Education. Um, and our aim as an organisation is um, that we're dedicated to quality, consistency and transparency in the way that humanitarian skills um, are trained, assessed and recognised. And I suppose um, the focus today is really on recognition. Um, because that's where our focus on digital badging comes in. So, um, in setting up this system, um, which we've been doing over the past couple of years now, uh, we've been trying to take into account some of the specific challenges uh, that are faced by humanitarians. Um, and one of them is that many humanitarians learn on the job. So, because they're often time poor, um, they often learn through practical experience rather than doing formal courses and assessments. Um, so we wanted to set up a system that can recognise all different kinds of learning. Um, so it can recognise things like when somebody has completed a course, but it can also recognise a range of other different things. Uh, we also thought about how humanitarians often move around um, between different locations um, and different organisations. Um, and often they need to be able to produce evidence quite quickly um, of their suitability for a particular post. Um, so we wanted the system that will help them do that. And then linked to that, the people that are working in recruitment in the sector um, often have to work very fast as well. And they want to be able to see evidence that people have met minimum standards before being deployed to an emergency response, um, or that they have specific skills that they've said they have on their CVs. Um, in the sector, we have a particular kind of issue, I guess, with people gathering up huge piles of um, different kind of completion certificates and things like that, lots of paper certificates that aren't really verifiable, um, and submitting those with an application. Um, so we wanted something that can kind of replace that and be a lot more transparent. Uh, and so this is just to give a rough idea of the kind of size of the sector that we're dealing with. Um, we're not necessarily at this stage um, planning to put in a system that is going to serve all of these people, but it's just to give a, a sense of the, the size of it. Um, and I suppose one of the key things here is the number of volunteers working in the sector um, compared to the kind of paid frontline workers. So what we find often is that there's lots of volunteers um, who are actually from the areas where emergencies most often take place. Um, and they work in emergencies there and they have lots of relevant um, knowledge and expertise. Um, but they don't necessarily have ways to get that formally recognised. Um, so we want something that serves that group um, as well as the international staff that move around often between different locations. So um, with that in mind, um, what we've created is um, HPASS, which has two um, specific services that we offer. Um, so on the one hand, um, you can see that we're um, enabling individual humanitarians to earn and display uh, digital badges in recognition of their specific skills and experience. Um, we work with different humanitarian organisations to create and issue those badges. Um, 
in recognition of the skills that they value as organisations. Um, and then the other key service that we offer, um, which I'm only going to touch on very briefly today, um, are these quality standards. So you can see there on the right hand side of my screen, um, there's two sets of standards. So one of them is the humanitarian learning quality standards. Um, and the other one is the quality standards for humanitarian assessment. Um, and those two sets of standards have been um, brought together consulting around 400 organisations worldwide. Um, and they really kind of bring together best practice from across the sector. Um, and the idea is that organisations can use those to benchmark the quality of their own learning. Um, but as I say, today I'm going to focus much more on um, the badging side of things um, and leave the quality standards for now. So, um, as mentioned, um, HPASS has been going as, a, as an idea for a few years now. Um, and it's only really last year in 2019 that it was actually launched as a kind of formal service. Uh, so you can see here some of the um, timeline and some of the things that we've been doing over the years. So in uh, 2011 to 2015, um, we worked with an organisation called ELRA um, and they did a lot of different pieces of research. Um, as you can see, they um, as you can see, they um, have consulted around 2,000 individuals, um, as well as uh, 34 different partners in 38 different countries. Um, and the findings of, those, of that research was that there is kind of appetite for um, the creation of um, a learning and development passport. And what, one of the things that we found out was that that appetite was greatest um, amongst uh, African and Asian respondents to the survey. So it was that group of people who um, have lots of local um, knowledge and relevant expertise that they use in emergencies, but often lack the ability or the facilities to be able to demonstrate that expertise to an employer. Uh, then during 2016 to 2017, um, the Academy very fortunately got some funding to put behind the development of this project. Uh, so we developed firstly um, the digital badging service and then um, the quality standards alongside that. Um, and we worked with a number of partners on that. Um, one of them was Beerforce Institute in France. I don't know if anyone's familiar with them. Um, as well as Redar and, and Pearson. Um, and then in 2018, we piloted some of those services um, with 34 organisations worldwide. Um, and in 2019, um, we took the learning from that pilot and we began to roll out some of these services. So to date, we're working with 26 different organisations and which have signed up to digital badging. Um, and so we really feel like um, this service is gaining a bit of momentum now. Now, guys, I have been told that I'm going to have to change room, unfortunately, because an important HR meeting needs to take place in this room. So I'm just going to very quickly move um, around the corner. I hope that's okay. And then okay, I will progress fine. with the next slide. So I'm really sorry sure. about that. I think it's a last minute meeting that wasn't planned. So now um, to talk through then where we're at, um, well, in 2020, but as a result of our work in 2019, um, which was when we began rolling out this service. Uh, so as mentioned, we've got uh, 26 different organisations currently using digital badging. Um, and we'll talk through a little bit um, some of the examples of the different ways that they're doing that. Um, and you can see some of the different organisations here. I think some of them are quite sort of familiar household names. Uh, so we've got Oxfam there, um, International Federation of the Red Cross, Voluntary Services Overseas, uh, World Vision, Save the Children, um, lots of the really big kind of international INGOs. Um, and then we've also got some kind of smaller uh, consultancies that deliver um, humanitarian training often in kind of technically niche areas. So for example, Clarity, um, or international location security. Uh, we have a couple of universities that are delivering humanitarian content. Uh, American University of Afghanistan being one, um, and American University of Beirut. 
Um, and then also just a couple of local organisations that the Academy has been working very closely with. So, for example, the Centre of Humanitarian Learning and Innovation um, is a partner that we work with closely in the Philippines. And what we've been doing um, is offering most of these organisations um, sponsored licences for 12 months. Um, so they can just give digital badging a try. Um, for many of them, it's a completely new concept, I guess. Um, so it's kind of to demonstrate over that first year um, the different ways that they can use it and really get them interested in the idea. Um, and we've been supporting them in a number of different ways. Um, so um, working with um, my colleague who's based in Canada, um, we offer them um, kind of tailored support based on the different um, things that, based on their specific needs in their organisation. Um, so we'll actually work with each organisation, I guess, for a good couple of hours or more to kind of think through um, what their ideas are around digital badging, help them develop their approach, um, develop their initial designs and things like that um, to really make them see that actually once they're into it, it's quite an easy process. Um, but we found that that is quite important to get them started. Then we also um, deliver web clinics. So we bring together um, the various organisations that are working on badging um, on around a quarterly basis. Um, and the idea with that is to kind of share new developments that we've got on offer through HPASS, but also enable them to um, share their own kind of learning and approaches. Um, so as we get more and more organisations that have progressed a little bit further through the process of developing their badges, we're getting some really interesting case studies as they share their work. Um, and what you can see in front of you there is this nice um, guide to digital badging that we developed. So this is kind of a manual, um, which we would never encourage anyone to read all at once. Um, but it's a really good reference guide for people to kind of look up um, different questions that they may have as they start to create their badges. So um, this slide shows some examples of how the organisations that we're working with are using HPASS in practice. Um, and you can see that we've taken a really kind of flexible approach here. Um, we're allowing organisations to use them as they see fit and we've found that there's been lots of different ideas coming out as a result. Um, you can also see just briefly to touch on the designs um, that we've got our own kind of HPASS design here um, that lots of organisations choose to use. Um, this kind of horseshoe shape and they use their own um, brand colour and add their own logo. Um, but we're also allowing organisations to go their own way if they choose not to use that. So for example, World Vision there um, have decided to use a different approach and that's also perfectly fine. Um, so starting in the top left then, um, BF Force Institute are using uh, badges just to recognise simply completion of face-to-face -face courses. Um, World Vision have taken a kind of a different approach whereby they created this Disaster Management Foundations badge, um, which actually draws together learning from a whole bunch of different organisations that they didn't want to have to um, recreate themselves as an organisation, but they wanted their staff to be able to take it. Um, so they've kind of curated different learning from different organisations to enable people to get this badge. And once people earn this badge in Disaster Management Foundations, um, it means that they are then eligible to join the organisation's international surge team. Um, so that basically means that they are eligible to be deployed in an emergency. <clears throat> uh, then Oxfam uh, developed this um, interesting badge on incident reporting. Um, and one of the ways that they're using it internally um, is that if people put that badge that they've earned into their e-signature, um, it demonstrates that they are somebody who has done a course in incident reporting and that other people can approach them for guidance on that topic. Uh, International Federation of the Red Cross decided to badge um, a network that they have internally um, called um, Learn to Change Network. Um, and that was uh, a group of people that have been really active in promoting learning throughout the, the network. Um, and they badge people at different levels. So some people wrote a really interesting proposal in order to be, become members of this network and they get a badge. 
Um, but then if you've also implemented a project as part of the network, you get another badge. And then if you've shared that with your colleagues, there's another one that you can get. Um, so this badge is really to represent people that have been going the extra mile um, within their roles. Um, we've got PHAP there that have badged um, completion of competency assessments. And then we've got Humanitarian U, which have also badged um, course completion, but with the criteria that you have to complete 48 hours um, of continuing professional development every two years in order to maintain that certification. So that was probably a little bit fast, but lots of different types of um, things that people are choosing to do here. Um, and I'd say that all the different organisations are at very different stages. Um, so some of them just got stuck in straight away. Um, quite often smaller organisations, I suppose, are able to make decisions quite quickly and, and get moving. And then bigger ones have lots of different stakeholders that they need to involve and they need to put together a really sort of rigorous strategy behind their badging approach. Um, so there's different ways that different organisations approach the task. Um, and then just to show you, I suppose, um, we've got, I guess, some real badge champions now um, amongst our network. Um, so we're starting to see that some of the organisations that we're working with are almost, you know, kind of inspired by the project and starting to have their own ideas, which they're contributing back into the project. Um, and that's great for us because we really want to shape HPASS around what our organisations need from us. So the more kind of inspiration we can get from them, the better. Uh, so this is uh, Leonie. You can see her in the corner there. She was actually doing um, a testimony for us, um, a little short video um, about her use of HPASS. Um, and she's been uh, creating digital badges um, to reward people for completing their induction and things like that um, at Warchild where she works. But one really interesting project that she's been looking into with another couple of organisations um, is this is called Team Up. And this is a project which is to do with um, people that volunteer to support um, refugee children who arrive in the Netherlands. Um, and it's a collaborative project between War Child, um, Save the Children Netherlands and UNICEF. Uh, so she's working with those other two organisations to create a badging strategy um, around that programme. And that's really interesting for us because firstly, it's the idea of there being a common badge across three organisations, uh, which really speaks to the long term objectives for HPASS in terms of improving consistency and the way that people's skills are recognised, um, but also it's bringing HPASS potentially to a new audience um, of volunteers that work there in the Netherlands and don't necessarily consider themselves to be formally part of the humanitarian sector. Uh, then we've got Save the Children, um, another fantastic use case here because um, firstly their badges are extremely popular um, and I think that's partly because they've developed um, a really fantastic program for field staff um, working in humanitarian settings. <clears throat> and as you can see, they spent a long time thinking through their particular badge language, which is very different to the designs that HPASS has come up with. Um, so they've got their own shapes here to represent if somebody's completed a module of the course, um, or if somebody's completed a whole pathway, or once somebody's completed the field program as a whole. Um, and so all of this is, is an online course that people can work their way through. But for them, they find that it's really great to break that course down into very small chunks um, in order that people have kind of motivation as they go through to complete each different section. Um, and then finally, just to show um, uh, one that the Humanitarian Leadership Academy created last year. Um, this is a course on safeguarding in emergencies. It's just a one hour introductory course. Um, and what's interesting about this was that the course itself was developed in consultation with 40 different organisations. Um, and those organisations, they didn't want to have to create their own um, course for this. They just want to have one that everybody understands has got the, the main elements that you need to know before being deployed. Um, so they all contributed to this one course and this one badge, which therefore has uh, potential to be recognised very widely across the sector. And it's also been an opportunity for us to use 
um, some of the functionality on OBF um, in a different way to what we had been doing before. So uh, you may know about the endorsement functionality. Um, this is where another organisation can endorse your badge, either to indicate to their staff that they think that they should take that course um, or to demonstrate that they've been involved in creating the course. And so we've got 11 different organisations that have endorsed this particular badge. Um, and for us, we feel that that really kind of increases the value of the badge for our audiences. Um, and so that's definitely a functionality that we'll be aiming to use again for different badges. Okay, um, so just to talk a little bit about what we did to um, develop our platform last year. Um, one of the things that we wanted humanitarians to be able to do is create this kind of online portfolio of all of their different skills and experience. Um, and so we call it a My HPAS profile. Um, and essentially, much like something like LinkedIn, I suppose, it enables you to create, um, add a little bit of information about uh, what you've been working on um, in your career and some contact details. But the main function is for you to be able to gather up all of this evidence of your skills and experience. So you can see here um, this mocked up profile um, of Victoria Kipchumba. Uh, and she has got um, three different badges showing there on her profile. Um, and so this is something that for us was a really important part of what we want to offer through HPAS. Um, so we worked really closely with Eric and his team in order to develop that. Um, and likewise, um, we worked with them to develop this dashboard function, um, which just enables people to navigate a little bit more easily the system when they first log in. Um, and you can see up there uh, on the right hand side um, that at the moment we've got around 2,000 individual users um, of MyHPass and around 4,000 different badges that have been shared. Um, that actually has just kind of grown up organically. So at the moment we haven't done any specific promotion to individual users because we've been focusing our efforts on the organisations that create and issue the badges. Um, but this year is going to be our big year for promoting to individuals. Um, so we're hoping to see that figure um, more than double, at least this year. Uh, and then other work that we've been doing this year is to invest in our communications. Uh, one thing we've been thinking a lot about is how, for many people, badging is such a new concept and we want to make it as clear as possible. Um, so we invested quite a lot in developing our website. Um, and we also thought about developing some other complementary materials. So we've got various different leaflets and things to give to people. Um, and we increased our social media presence. Um, so you can find us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, one thing that we also want to do um, is increasingly uh, promote HPASS through another website that the Academy runs, um, and that's called Kaya. Um, and that's a website which offers uh, over 400 different humanitarian courses. Um, many of which are now starting to be badged. So increasingly, we'll try to find ways to direct people on the Kaya website to courses where they can earn a digital badge. So let me just check the time briefly. Okay, we're still fine. Um, so just to talk a little bit then about what's next for 2020 and some of our plans. Um, as I said, we're planning to um, increase our individual users. So at the moment we've got 2,000 and we want to reach at least 4,500 by the end of the year. Uh, we also want to reach around 10,000 followers across all platforms, so including MyHPASS, but also across our social media. Um, we're trying to crack the issue of how to raise awareness of digital badging among humanitarians themselves. Um, so that they know that this is a, a recognised um, way to demonstrate their skills. Uh, we've developed some user guidance which we're sending out to organisations to share with their staff, to edit and share with their staff in their own forms. Um, we've created lots of different interesting kind of social media graphics to try to explain the concept of the MyHPASS profile um, and to kind of direct them towards different um, organisations where they can earn digital badges. Um, and then also what we've done is developed um, a couple of videos 
uh, to explain how um, HPASS works in practice. Um, I'm not sure whether we've got time to look at them today, but what I can do is send them around if other people find them useful um, in any way. But one of them is to do with um, getting started. So just explaining people the process of earning and accepting your first badge um, and displaying it on my HPASS. Um, and the second one is about how to share your badges to LinkedIn. Um, so they're just kind of short, like two to three minute videos um, to give people an overview of that process. This year, we're also intending to continue to work with our organisational users. Um, so planning to reach with 35 organisations by the end of the year. Um, as you saw earlier, we've got lots of different international NGOs on our list already. Um, so we want to start thinking about different types of organisations we could work with. So whether we can expand uh, the number of universities that we're working with, for example, or start to work more with local organisations um, could be interesting for us. Um, and we've just badged a course that's in partnership with um, the South Sudan NGO Forum. Um, so that kind of represents a, a new type of audience for us. Um, and I think that's something that we definitely want to build on this year. Um, and one thing we want to do is start to um, really draw in some of the people that have shown a lot of interest um, in, the, in HPASS from among our users. Um, so, for example, Leone, whose picture you saw earlier, would be a classic example um, of somebody who's got great ideas to contribute. So if there's any way that we can draw those people together um, and get them to uh, help us think through ways to create commonly recognised badges across the sector and ways that we can um, get these organisations to collaborate, that's something that we're interested in doing this year. Um, we're also thinking about whether there's new functionality that we can offer this year um, and then also how we um, communicate new functionality that's coming anyway to our own users. Uh, so one of those is the mobile app um, that Eric and his team are developing. We're really excited about that, um, especially because for a lot of our audiences, they won't necessarily always have access to really good internet. Uh, so the idea that you can store your badges offline could be very exciting. Um, and we want to think about how we can communicate that to our users. Um, and then secondly, we're really interested um, in how to improve uh, the kind of analytics and reporting functionality um, on the system. Um, and that's something that we've been talking to Eric about. So how as HPASS can we get oversight of all the different organisations activities um, that are using our services um, and start to understand a little bit what the trends are in terms of the most popular badges or the organisations that are most active. Um, and then also, how can we offer our organisations the opportunity to be able um, to access some of that data as well? Um, so particularly some of our bigger organisations will want to be able to track very closely um, among their users um, what their activity is, what courses they've been completing, um, whether they've been sharing their badges and things like that. Um, and then lastly, we're really interested in supporting more of our user organisations to take up the quality standards. Um, so those are the standards that I mentioned um, right at the beginning, um, which are our second service under HPASS. Um, I suppose one of the questions that often comes up and is an ongoing um, sort of area of interest for us is, well, how do you maintain quality across so many different organisations that are using your service? Um, and it's not an easy question to answer. Um, we've been thinking through it in different ways. So for example, the, the endorsements is one way that you can demonstrate the quality of a badge. Um, you can make sure that each organization uses very clear language inside the badges um, in terms of what that badge represents and make sure that there's consistency there. Um, but there's not just one answer. So one thing that we'll be increasingly encouraging our organizations to do um, is also use these um, learning and assessment standards um, to back up their work. And that's it from my presentation. Um, so I'll be very happy to take some questions. I can also attempt to show you one of the little videos if that would be useful. Um, thanks. Thank you very much, Esther.
Do okay. you have uh, questions? So perhaps uh, Mina, if you could take the open the, the microphones. If, uh, yes, yeah. I will do that. I will un unmute everyone now. Okay. So oh, please. <laughs> That I could say if uh, people need some time to figure uh, questions, to plan the question, is that uh, uh, the edge pass is really an um, interesting uh, big I would say, project and, and, uh, because uh, you, you have been uh, planning and thinking and designing the badge, uh, the, uh, issuing badges at, um, at the, I would say, network level. So it's, uh, it's from the beginning, it's not uh, issuing badges for myself as an organization. It's, it's serving a huge uh, network. And uh, of course, uh, I think you have been doing a great job with communication because it's uh, communication. I think it's one very important uh, aspect of this uh, project. Um, the first thing, and the second thing that we have been really working uh, together on improving improving solutions, making more smooth uh, solutions for people to get the badges and the the, the edge pass. I mean, edge pass is the first uh, basically installation of what we call a dedicated passport, so it's open badge passport, but it's installed for one organization. And um, and with edge pass, we have been doing a, a lot of uh, very good uh, development on usability, as Esther showed about the dashboard, for example, the profile. And I'm very excited about what we will do about analytics, because I think that now the next step is not only to understand what uh, people are doing with the badges and to have, based on this data, the possibility to set up strategies and, and to basically um, see what, what is happening in the, in the community, in the, in the network with, with badges. So it's, uh, uh, I would say the Edge Pass is a very, very uh, interesting uh, project because it's uh, basically, it's communication, it's development, it's engagement of collaboration. And uh, I'm amazed <laughs> that uh, you have got things uh, working with the uh, organization which have, of course, the same um, goals in a way, but are very different. I think that uh, this big organization that you have been speaking about are very different. Uh, yeah. I don't know if, you, if I'm wrong, but they have their own identity, their own, their own uh, ways to, to work. Yeah, absolutely. They're all completely different. Um, and I think that's one of the really interesting things about working with them as a network is that to some extent you're offering them a service but really you're kind of waiting to see what is it that they want from you and trying to um anticipate that and and develop things according to what each organization needs um so for me it's been a really interesting year last year um getting beyond the kind of theory of what hpath was meant to be and actually into the the practical application um yeah and being able to to find out what people really want from this service. Yeah. And um, the other question, which is, in my opinion, unique in all the open bash project and, and uh, venture that we, we have been following, the question of quality. Uh, personally, I was not um, at the beginning when I start to, started to work with a humanitarian uh, organization. I was not myself thinking very much about quality. I, I saw that badges will be more for recognition of, would say, uh, soft skills, um, recognition of basically skills and, and, and uh, competencies on the, the on the ground, I would say. But um, I think it's very uh, interesting that, to see that to see badges also uh, as a way to uh, improve quality uh, mm. in, in your in your action. In your can you tell a, a bit more uh, about this uh, quality? Uh, would say. Yeah. So I suppose 
in the sector as a whole, there's a really big drive towards um, professionalisation, I suppose, at the moment. Um, and I guess partly that's driven internally, but also um, people will probably be aware of in the papers and things like that over the past few years, there's been various different scandals and things. Um, which points to the fact that there's not necessarily always enough investment in the training of people and making sure that people understand the systems and things like that prior to them being deployed. Um, so I suppose there's two elements with badging in, in the humanitarian sector. One of them is supporting people's professional development. Lots of people in the sector have a huge drive to um, be doing a great job and they want to get as much training as possible and be able to evidence that. Um, but there's also meeting the kind of minimum standards at the other end of the spectrum. So knowing when you send somebody out into a, a particular um, emergency, that they've got the basics in place. Um, and different organisations have been doing that differently um, across the sector for years and years. Um, so anything that we can do to try to increase the kind of consistency with which organisations do that um, is going to be really useful. I think and we're definitely not there yet but that's just kind of more the the long-term idea um is to be able to to make it so that it becomes really obvious that somebody has met the minimum standards before they get deployed so related to this question you have a question in the chat are you looking to harmonize skills or competency assessment across the organization using hpass so we don't have a specific um, agenda to do that driven by HPASS itself. But what we want to do this year is um, facilitate conversations that other organisations want to have on that. Um, so we're starting to get organisations showing an interest in the idea that if they're offering, for example, a, a safeguarding course, that that should be somehow comparable to the one that is being offered elsewhere. Um, or likewise um, heat training which is like hostile environment training that people have to have before they go into an insecure situation that's being offered in many different ways across the sector and we're getting some questions about well how could that be um, recognized more consistently so i think at this stage um, it's too big a sector with too many different approaches for us to really say we're going to create one system which all, everybody has to use i mean that would be impossible for us but it's more that as people start to kind of realize what the potential for this system is we want to be able to facilitate those conversations um, and hopefully i guess my aim this year would be if we have um, a few kind of use cases of that happening in practice which we can then start to use um, to demonstrate to other organizations that this is the way to, to go that one of the perhaps the first step direction is um, endorsement. The endorsement is a way to uh, to recognize uh, common badges or badges which have a common value, and, and uh, so it's I would say it's a, it's quite a interesting, flexible way endorsement, a flexible way to to go in this uh, direction. Yeah, definitely. I think that endorsement feature is great because it also hopefully should kind of help to drive um, some efficiencies in the sector as well, because rather than having to create your own thing at great cost and with lots of time having to be put into it, you can just find a course that somebody else is already offering and endorse that. Um, so hopefully that's something that we can be promoting. Any other questions? Okay, second question. No, it's not a question. <laughs> okay, we have to leave. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you on this seminar. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, any other questions for Esther? So I think Esther, you had your your uh, email address somewhere in this presentation, or? Um, yeah, I'm not sure whether I put it in, but anyway, it's info at hpass.org. Um, so if anyone's got any other questions, uh, feel free to send them through to that email address um, and we'll pick them up from there. Okay. So if we don't have any other questions, um, thank you very much, Esther, for this great uh, presentation. And 
it will be, it has been recorded and it will be on the Open Badge um, OBF Academy uh, site, I think in, in one or two days. Two days. And, uh, thank you very much. Great. Thanks, thank everyone. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye.